Uh, I'm Maya Conforti. I'm the secretary of L'Auberge des Migrants. L'Auberge des Migrants is the biggest local NGO that uh, works in uh, Calais, in the jungle of Calais. In the jungle of Calais right now we have about 5,000 refugees who are staying here because they want to go to the UK, not because they want to stay in France. Uh, they are refugees uh, from Afghanistan, from Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, uh, Syria, few from Egypt, few from Pakistan, uh, what else, Iraq also, Kurdish people. And so that's, those are the you know, primary nationalities, there's very few of any others. So all those people want to go to England. Uh, for several reasons. Uh, first, they might have families there, you know, brothers, sisters, parents. Um, so they want to be reunited with their family, but the British government uh, uh, is very bad about allowing family reunification and uh, the British and the French are, citizens are really fighting for uh, these people's rights to be uh, to be acknowledged because you should have the right to be reunited with your family but uh, the British government is not very willing to do that. Uh, the other reason why they want to go to England is that many of the refugees speak English or even if they don't speak English they have ties somehow with the UK, their countries have ties from the UK, you know, former colonies or, or former countries that, you know, that the British uh, uh, Empire had ties with. So obviously they want to go to the UK because of that. They also know that uh, it is easier in the UK to get a job and to get a job all together, you know, in Europe, except maybe Germany, but it's definitely easier than Italy. It's definitely easier than France. And it's especially easier to get a job under the table. Okay. You know, um, so the refugees, who, those 5,000 people who are here now, have been in this jungle for one year. I mean, no, this jungle has been in existence for one year. Uh, the refugees before, a year ago, were scattered in about eight or nine different squats and jungles uh, spread out through Calais. The mayor of the town absolutely did not like refugees to be in the middle of the town and managed to convince the government to push the refugees out of the city because they were basically uh, in, you know, they had their tents in, on private properties behind factories and parks uh, uh, next to a church, things like that. So they were not on, they were on private property and the city wanted them out of the town and so the government uh, came up and the city together came up with this piece of land uh, which belongs half, of, half to the city and half to the region and the government told the refugee basically you need to move there you will be tolerated on this piece of land you will that means tolerated means it's okay for you to be there but when it's not okay for you anymore we have the right to chase you okay you have no rights to this place but we're gonna give you, we're gonna let you be for now. So this was a year ago. So all the people, they had no choice but to move here. They were basically told you move or else we use tear gas and we chase you out and we become violent. So they moved. Uh, at that time, a year ago, there were 1500 people who moved here, but the population grew to 3000 in June dwindled down in July because many people succeeded to go to England and then it climbed back up in August and September there were 6,000 people uh, and uh, and now there's about five. So uh, L'Auberge is was a year ago a very small NGO. Uh, we were about 25 members but 10 really active and there were there was there were two other very small associations who were uh, busy helping the refugees but remember it was only 1500 refugees 
And uh, when the numbers started climbing up to 3,000, we started going crazy because we did not have what all those people needed. We would have 50 to 60 people arriving every single day to give tents to, sleeping bag, clothing. Uh, they were cold, you know, they, they were coming from Italy, from Sicily, from Lampedusa. They were coming in shorts and t-shirts and even it was May, June here and they were cold. In July, um, there was a big strike of uh, fair, people who were working on the ferries went on strike because they were losing their job and they decided to block the port and block the tunnel as, to, as a protest. This created tremendous traffic jams and was a very good thing for the refugees because they succeeded many, many, 1500 people in two weeks succeeded to make it to the UK. So it was you know, the heaven of, of this place for the refugees. However, those traffic jams cre created tremendous strife in England because it blocked the ferries, the, the trucks from leaving uh, the UK and the English people were very unhappy about that. But anyway, this huge traffic jams uh, made all the journalists from all over the world arrive in Calais to try to see what was going on because there were people, climb, refugees, uh, climbing in trucks all the time and you know it was made, made very uh, colorful pictures and so they all came and uh, um, so there was much of that on the news in the UK however many British people uh, felt that the medias were not telling them the truth and were showing them you know not exactly what was happening so a few uh, British people decided to come in August and come and see the jungle and see what it was like. And uh, they called me and they said, we want to see the jungle, can you help us uh, see the jungle? They, I took them around for three days and they were amazed at what they saw. Because, because this place was a, was a piece of land where people had been tolerated, there was two things happening. Well, first, when they moved here, there was nothing. When 1,500 people moved here, the government uh, gave them a piece of land that was actually a, for, a former a garbage dump, and there was nothing on it. There was no water. Only one water point for 35 acres. There was no street lighting. There were no streets. There was no garbage pickup. There were no toilets. So the conditions, the living conditions for 1,500 people were horrible. The associations complained a lot. We got a few street lights, a few toilets, a couple of water points, but still way below what was needed. So the British people, when they came here, saw how horrible the situation was. Everybody, 1,500, well, by that time, 3,000 people in tents and so much, so little water, so few toilets and so forth. However, there was something else too that they saw, which what they were amazed about, is that also the refugees had taken this place a little bit at their, as their own and they had built grocery stores, few bakeries, few restaurants, uh, a church, several mosques uh, and a school and they thought these refugees are interesting people, they do things, they build things themselves yet they live in bad conditions, we need to help them. So they went back home and uh, this uh, young woman whose name is Jazz wrote a post on her personal Facebook page and she got 60,000 likes in three days. And she did a fundraiser and she raised in 10 days, 10 times what she was expecting to raise in one month. And then all of a sudden, England started to know what was happening here. Not only what was in the news, but what what was what this woman had talked about and uh, many British people are against the politics of David Cameron they want to welcome the refugees and so they just thought we have to help the refugees and Calais is very close so we're gonna go help in Calais and they started coming and when the British come they come big
and it was an amazing thing because they came with vans and vans and trucks of goods to distribute. The Belgians came also, but mostly the British. So many things to give, so much willingness to help. Uh, it was fantastic because we needed everything. We didn't have enough to give to all these people. But it was also incredibly chaotic it was because so many people come with so many things and no experience on how to give to refugees and so forth. So it was crazy. And for several weeks, it was crazy every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It was absolutely maddening, maddening sight because it was so disorganized. And so L'Auberge, uh, as an association, we decided we needed to uh, take all this energy and try to organize it because otherwise it, you know, it led to violence because people were fighting over things and stuff like that. So we decided uh, instead of letting all those goods arrive in the jungle and being poorly distributed because people were not organized, we were going to bring it to a warehouse, organize it, then distribute it. All this happened in two months. Thanks to the donation, so we had mostly one, uh, in great part, a big organization, British organization that's been helping us, that's called Help Refugees, but many, many other British people, the foundations and so forth. And within two months, L'Auberge multiplied by 10 in uh, donations, amount of money to work with, in uh, goods to distribute, clothing, shoes, food, uh, in number of meals distributed, and we started also building shelters, putting because we thought it was September, we knew the winter was coming, we knew those 6,000 people were not going to survive in tents, they needed shelters, proper, right? yeah. more proper than tents, because shelters, tents fall down in the storms, and uh, uh, so shelters and uh, a number of volunteers. So L'Auberge literally multiplied by size and by actions done in 10, in two months' time. It was, it's unheard of, but that's what happened. Uh, and it was incredibly difficult to organize, but it also led, it showed uh, the wonder of citizen solidarity. It's just been actually as, as crazy as it was at first, because it was so chaotic, it ended up being becoming a really beautiful thing. So suddenly we went from 10 volunteers a day to 50 to 120 volunteers every single day, helping the refugees. Many of them who came for one week are still here six months later. Uh, many of them bringing their ideas and their, their skills, their you know, basically their dreams. So some of them building a theater, some of them building a school, some of them building a library, a women's center, a youth center, all kinds of things and, and making it happen. And so all of a sudden, this jungle, they call it jungle because it means the woods in Pashto and this is where uh, the refugees moved at first several years ago. So this, this place that had only a few restaurants and a few grocery stores, a, a school, a mosque, and, and, uh, and a church that the refugees had done, also ended up having all those other collective community structures. And basically, this jungle started, was moved into uh, April 1st of last year, so there was nothing on this piece of land April 1st of last year. Nine months later, it had become a city. Literally a city. A city with streets, with a few street lights, with water points, with chemical toilets, not enough, but, you know, and mud and all that, but a slum. More than a city, a slum. But with everything that the city has. 
church, school, uh, community center, uh, restaurants, uh, hammam, places to wash, uh, everything. And, uh, and also, so not only the feel of a city, but also the feel of solidarity between uh, refugees and, and volunteers, I'm going to say Europeans, because we had Europeans coming from every country. We've had Spanish, Italian, uh, Austrian, German, Belgian, tons of British. We've also had a few Americans, South Americans, um, mostly British, but still. Europeans, Europeans and refugees started really working together and so after nine months we really also saw that uh, the Europeans would ask the refugees what do you want? What How about help French you? people? French people, okay, f I forget to mention French people, of course we were the first ones here, the French people uh, came, they were always you know not as many as the British and now they're more and more uh, they're coming more and more. They, they it took them time, but now they're here. They're here. Uh, two months, uh, two months ago, uh, the government first decided to uh, destroy a 100-meter band all around the jungle because it said that uh, uh, too many people were trying to climb into the trucks on the highway that's nearby and they wanted distance between the refugees and the highway. So they first started destroying 100-meter bands. Uh, the, the association, the Lauberge, helped people move and basically crowd themselves in the in the jungle, you know, put more houses close together. That's and then we thought it was gonna be all and we thought pretty good, okay, we allowed everybody we 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 found a way for everybody to move inside and respect what the government want, but three weeks later the government basically told we're going to destroy the jungle. And they said we're going to destroy half of the jungle first. They call that's a southern part, and then we'll destroy. After that, we'll destroy the northern part. And uh, so they have destroyed the south part. Um, Eighty percent of the people who were in the south part, it was about three thousand people, have moved in the north part. They have not gone away. They've just moved in the north part and crowded it even more. And for now, the government as actually doesn't know when it's going to destroy it. It said we're not going to touch it for two months, but we have no promises. It could be more, it could be less. We have no no, no or extremely little trust in what the government says because it basically does what it wants and, and it does not tell us in advance what it's going to do. But so far so good, the North part seems okay. But the plan is definitely to destroy it.